Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that brings behavioral science to life. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We like to investigate the aspects of behavioral science that will improve your well-being, your relationships, your organization. And this podcast might even save the world. Okay, wait. <laughs> um, save the world? What you talking about, Mr. Houlihan? I, I am pretty sure that you might have changed our introduction there because we have never said that Behavioral <laughs> Grooves is going to go out and save the world before. Well, we've never interviewed Eric Angner before either. And so we've never talked about his latest book, which is How Economics Can Save the World, Simple Ideas to Solve Our Biggest Problems. Okay, you got me there. there you, go. you got me there. All right. <laughs> and, and while Eric isn't saying that saving the world with economics is easy or fast – or even the only tool in the toolbox, this book and our discussion with him do point out some simple science-supported ideas that can make the world a better place. And he does not just focus on small issues. Oh, no. Oh, no. He tackles the big problems. Yeah, uh, Agreed. So maybe some of the most serious problems of our time, Kurt. And he has lots of good science to back up his recommendations. So in the book, he covers remedies for poverty, climate change, parenting. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> Changing bad behavior, happiness, and more. And we were able to cover at least a bit of those topics in our discussion with him today. Yeah, and these are wicked problems, as we like to say. And Eric is looking at this, and he relies on insights from economics to help solve them. And I'm excited to hear what our listeners think about this episode. I, I want to know if they think we are being too Pollyannish here, or if there is some merit to the uh, these ideas. And we want to hear from you, our listeners. And, you know, and more than just hearing from you, we want to have a conversation with you, Groovers. We invite you to go out to Twitter and answer some questions that we posted under the Behavioral Grooves tag. Now, if you already follow us, cool, it'll show up in your feed. If you're not following us, you can find these questions by following us at Behavioral Groove, and that's without the E or the S at the end. Uh, but look for the polls that we've posted and share your thoughts. That That's what we want to hear. Yeah. One of the things that I love about doing a podcast is the conversations that we have with our guests. But Tim, I also love the conversations that we have with our listeners. We are a community that is looking at improving our lives and Maybe, just maybe even saving the world. <laughs> and we do that through interaction and conversation with each other about the ideas and the actions that we can take and the insights that we learn from the behavioral science that we get to study and look at. Absolutely. So we invite you to join in with us on social media, share your thoughts on the topic. But first, please sit back and pick up your favorite Saving the World brew and enjoy our conversation with Eric Angner. Eric Angner, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you for having me. It is such a pleasure to have you. It's so, it's so much fun that we get to, to talk after all these years. And uh, we're gonna start with a, a speed round. So we have to know first and foremost, coffee, or tea? Coffee, I'm afraid. It, Sweden, you know, of course. You gotta you gotta go with coffee. I mean, my yeah, grandparents you know how... are, you know, Swedish and that's coffee like three times a day. It doesn't matter what time of the day or night it is, they're just drinking. Do you know how dark time. it is this time of year? <laughs> <laughs> good point. I didn't ever put the, those two that's together. Right, yeah. That's a really good part. All right. So, second, so it's a stay awake strategy, basically. Yeah, it's drugs. <laughs> okay. yeah. Second second speed round question here. Is it true that your twin daughter's nicknames are Moon and Coffee Shop? <laughs> that is entirely true, yeah. <laughs> so I, I have to tell you the story now. So my yeah. wife and I had uh, some degree of indecision when they were born. Like, we had some names, but we couldn't quite settle on 
on any. And then we have an older daughter who was four at the time. And she was like, you guys don't worry your little heads about it. Well, we'll I'll sort it out. And she was like, that one is going to be moon. And that one is going to be coffee shop. And so when they were born, we told the staff that, you know, here are the working names, right? That one is moon and that one is coffee shop. And they were slightly alarmed where they were born in the DC area. Apparently, like, very few people did not already have a name. So this was slightly weird to them. Um, but the staff were one Wonderful. The kids, the twins were somewhat premature, so they spent a few weeks in a NICU and the staff like decorated their little their little rooms with moon and coffee shop and some decorations and stuff. And they so the names did. Had oh my gosh. I'll be very interested as they grow up, kind of. Is there will there be any components? Will will one of them really like coffee? Will one be <laughs> kind of a, you know, a Planetarist. Planet- <laughs> How did you guys even know about these nicknames? Ah, we have a great <laughs> oh. researcher who does some background checks on things uh, oh, by the man. name of Mary, by the way. So there you go. <laughs> Hi, Mary. I <laughs> shudder to think what she might have discovered. Well, <laughs> it, we're not gotcha journalists, so we're not out there looking for the bad stuff. But I do want to ask, and in our third speed round question, is it true or is it not true that a good pair of loudspeakers can pretty much cure every ill? <laughs> to me, a pair of good loudspeakers have been a blessing. I have been so happy about them. Like, and the reason why I bring this up, it appears in the book, is that there's a ton of evidence that we adapt to material belongings, right? That we buy a new car or a new bed or whatever. And It's delightful for a little while. It makes it happier. But then over time, as we adapt, it gives us less and less pleasure. And then we return to baseline or whatever. And I bring up the speakers as a sort of counter example to that general rule. Like these speakers still give me joy 15 years or whatever after the fact. And I'm so glad I made that investment back in grad school when I really couldn't afford them. (laughs) And what, what brand of loudspeakers are these? Oh, I don't even remember. I'm sorry. I'm not a fanatic like that. I kind of love that, actually, that you researched it. I'm sure you, you're a researcher, so I'm sure you took time to decide. And then all you're focused on is the joy of the experience and not what brand it is. God, that's I, right. I guess I'm not brand conscious like that. No, I think that's really cool. Okay, uh, Kurt, go ahead. <laughs> last, last speed round question. <laughs> last speed round question, Eric. Is economics just the study of stock markets or is there something more to this economic thing? Because, you know... Right? That's all you see on television. They're just talking about the stock market. Is it going up and down? It is not that major (laughs) misconception, right? (laughs) Economics is about everything that makes for a life well lived. Everything connected to human well-being, really. uh, Connected to human choice and values and preferences and desires. And so it's very broad indeed. And I think that's important to to appreciate. And uh, I wish economics had a better PR operation because we're doing (laughs) collectively a terrible job of explaining what we are and what we're for. Yeah. So you are an economist that lives in the world of behavioral economics and behavioral sciences. Uh, Help our listeners understand what's the difference between this neoclassical economics that you studied probably and sort of how you practice it. Yeah, so neoclassical economics is like the traditional mode of economics that's based to a great extent on ideas of like perfect information and rational choice and so on. Behavioral economics is a more contemporary mode that puts more stress on like the psychology of it, to some extent, the neuroscience of it. It's more interdisciplinary. It uses a wider array of data and so on. But in the book, I try to sort of downplay the difference between these two things because there used to be sort of a very sharp distinction. Like when I was young-ish and went to grad school, like these people would barely talk to each other. And that's changed for the better. It's become the norm now that straight-laced economists, traditional economists will rely on ideas from behavioral economics when they think it's useful and appropriate. And that's exactly right. I mean, that's what they ought to be doing. And so economics is useful. Sometimes rational choice models are are mm. useful. They may look nuts, but then again, that's how science works, right? Newton's theory, one of the most successful scientific theories of all times, it assumes that planets and things are point masses. They're infinitely small. Gravity works across the universe instantaneously and so on. If you just look narrowly at the assumptions that go into the theory, they're wild, they're obviously false. And yet the theory that you can build on the basis of these assumptions is dead on. 
And something similar is true. I mean, I, economics is not w- what New- Newtonian physics is, <laughs> right, to physics. But the fact that the assumptions are sometimes sort of wildly false is not in and of itself a problem. And I think that's also worth appreciating. It's interesting you talk about the way that it used to be and the way that it is. We go back to Richard Thaler, you know, in the early parts of the the behavioral economics kind of revolution, whatever you want to call it, uh, and some of the decisions that he, not him himself, but that were made back then specifically to say, look, we want this to become part of the economics piece where at some point in the future, it isn't behavioral economics, it isn't neoclassical economics, it is just economics. And it sounds like from what you're saying that it's getting there, that this vision um, that was had by, you know, a lot of the early practitioners is actually coming true. I think I think that's right. I mean, for a long time, people have thought of economics as a set of tools, right, as a set of strategies and devices that you can apply to study the world, to understand it and to control it and so on. And if you think of economics in those terms, you can just think of sort of behavioral theory and neoclassical theory as different tools in the toolbox. Depending Mm. on what you want to accomplish, you reach for the one tool or the other, right? It'd be sort of weird to be a carpenter who's into hammers, right? Who only uses (laughs) hammers or one who only uses saws. Um, A competent economist should be aware of like all these different tools and should be ready to use whichever works in context. I love that. Yeah. So we're here because you've just written a book and the book is titled How Economics Can Save the World. And we talked prior to, to getting live here about how there was some negotiation with the editors on that title. So help us understand when you say how economics can save the world, and it isn't, the title isn't not how economics has already saved the world, it's, it's how it can. <laughs> help us understand a little bit about what you're trying to convey with this book. Yeah, well, economics very obviously hasn't already saved the world, right? <laughs> that's why that's why we're here. Fair enough. Yeah. The thesis, the claim of the book is that economics can save the world in much the way that modern medicine can cure the body, right? It's true to say that medicine does good, that it cures disease and so on, but that doesn't mean that medicine does it like automatically and magically and uh, immediately. Medicine still needs to be applied wisely. It needs to be practiced by somebody who knows what they're doing. It needs to be wielded with a minimum of like ethics and maybe a sense of aesthetics and so on. It's also not true that like everything that cures necessarily is medicine. And it's not true that medicine will always cure on its own, right? You often have to combine medication with diet and exercise and so on. And by analogy, I'm not saying economics is going to fix every problem like on its own magically and immediately. What I'm saying is that it's a real useful tool that on the whole can do a lot of good in the world, provided that it's used wisely, wielded with ethics and a sense of aesthetics and so on. And so, um, you know, I, I don't want to overstate what economics can do, but I am willing to say that economics can do a lot of good, certainly a lot more good w- than we would be able to do without it. Uh, that's, I, I love the analogies, Eric, the really just terrific ways of f- sort of framing these these issues. And in the book, you tackle some really damn big issues. <laughs> you, you didn't go after the little stuff. Uh, well, I, I was going to joke about parenting, but that's a big issue as well. But you <laughs> talk about climate change and organ donation. And one of the things that really struck us that Kurt and Mary and I are very passionate about is poverty. And uh, you, talk about, you talk about poverty. So I was wondering if we could spend a few minutes on the way that you think economics can help address and eliminate poverty. I mean, you're not making this grand claim, not a magic wand, but can you tell us a little bit about economics and poverty specifically? Yeah. So obviously we should start off by recognizing that poverty and persistent poverty is a uh, complicated problem, right? It has multiple causes. There's not going to be like one obvious fix. But nonetheless, we can say, I think, that there are some things that we could do that would make things better on the whole for poor people. And what I talk about primarily in the relevant chapter is just the the possibility of just giving poor people money. 
is if you listen to the media discussion, politicians talking about poverty, there are lots of concerns about, you know, the poor judgment uh, of, of poor people, their bad character. Some people will talk about their bad genes, you know, blaming their poverty on their genetics. And of course, what all these sorts of concerns point toward is a sort of hopelessness, the sort of idea that, well, we can't do anything. If we give the poor money, they're not ultimately going to be better off, or even worse, they're going to use the extra rope that we give them to, to hang themselves. And so I think it's really important to point out that economists have studied this. This is a question that's amenable to empirical investigation. And by and large, the research suggests that poor people are no better and no worse at making decisions. There's some indication that they're better because those of us who are comfortably well off in rich countries with functioning social welfare systems and whatever, we're playing in easy mode in a way, right? <laughs> if you're poor and you live in a country without a social safety net, you're playing in much more advanced mode. You really have to pay attention because you're already on the edge of the, the precipice. But anyway, what the research suggests, and this is research from across the world, is that poor people do just fine making decisions on their own. And so the suggestion here is instead of having all sorts of means tested program, instead of giving people vouchers for certain kinds of foods, but not other kinds of food, the best thing we can do, the most efficient thing we can do, the most respectful thing we can do is just to give them money. <laughs> There's little waste associated with this. We respect people's autonomy. We respect their integrity. And um, it seems to work. You can take the edge off the worst poverty, uh, the worst suffering by giving people money. And what, one thing that's interesting about this is that economics often gets associated with, you know, right-wing politics, whatever. And, and to some extent, that may be true, right, when it comes to the reliance of markets on markets, for example, in the distribution of goods and services. But this idea of like giving poor people money is something that you might otherwise associate with the left, right? Yeah. But then right-wing economists believe it too. So Friedrich Hayek, uh, uh, best yeah. example of this, yes. right? Um, a fan of Thatcher and Reagan. Thatcher and Reagan were fans of his, um, you know, a bit of an icon in the libertarian and conservative movements to this day. And he believed we should give poor people money. He was in favor of non-means-tested, -mean unconditional transfers to, to poor people. In fact, he thought everyone should get free money from the government, right? That's not what you expect. But um, it's a view that economists from left to right have endorsed for, you know, generations. And I'd say we haven't tested it. We haven't tried it yet yeah. to the extent that we could. It's interesting because uh, you bring up Friedrich Hayek and that, that was it was unknown to me and it, it kind of blew my mind when I read that because knowing that, you know, he was the free markets are the thing to do and you just don't associate that. And I have been a big advocate of of UBI, universal basic income for a number of years now, not only from uh, some of the research that we've seen, what it can do in various different things, but also just in kind of looking at potentially where the economy is going and automation and, and a number of other things that you can agree or disagree on and on where the future brings that. But where part of this too that you bring up is this idea of scarcity. And you bring up um, a lot of work from Sendel uh, and Eldar, and I, I'm not going to try to pronounce uh, Sendel's last name because <laughs> I can never say it right. But the, the idea that scarcity uh, brings about a number of various different behavioral aspects as well as kind of outcomes that impact this, that a unconditional transfer can kind of alleviate. Can you talk a little bit about scarcity and how that influences our behavior? Yeah. So there's a, a ton of research on how sort of a perceived scarcity affects the way in which you make decisions. And I think to some extent, this is familiar to everyone, right? If you're running short on time, for example, you're in a rush in the morning, you're headed out of your apartment, you're catching a bus, right? Where's the phone? Where are your keys? The more rushed you get, the more scarce you feel the time is, the more likely you are to make mistakes, right? You're, you're pressed for time. It affects your cognitive performance. You would probably do better getting out of the house if you calmed down a bit and didn't feel so rushed, but you might not be able to. And that phenomenon is, you know, according to this strand of research, a more an example of a more general phenomenon where when you feel that you're running short on something, uh, money uh, or time, you, you're, it, if that feeling interferes with your ability to deal with your problem. And so people who are 
poor, people who are desperately poor, who feel that way, are not in a position to make the sort of wise decisions that they should. And this is an argument for a universal basic income or something along those lines, just like giving people money so that they get out of that sort of extreme state of, of scarcity or perceived scarcity. But it's also, and this is something that other economists have pointed out, a reason for us to make the life of poor people easier. So, so much uh, so many policies are designed to make their lives harder, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, we can't let them buy hot foods with their vouchers, right? <laughs> we have to make sure they buy carrots and go home and cook them because that's good for them oh, and yeah. so on, right? Uh, it's supposed to build character and so on. And it is, in effect, making the lives of poor people harder. Whereas what we ought to be doing if we want to relieve, relieve their sense of scarcity is to make their lives easier, like give them money, one, but also maybe provide goods and services that they need. So childcare, I think, is a great example. If you want, say, you know, a young single mother to get back into the workforce, start making money, you know, get the dignity of having a, a job, uh, being able to support herself and her family and whatever, you've got to figure out a way to, to provide her with, with childcare. And although she could buy childcare in a free market, that's associated with a, a ton of, of effort. And so maybe we should figure out ways to provide um, childcare. It doesn't have to be done by the government, right? You could have churches right. or temples provide this sort of service as well, but the government can do it. And that sort of thing, making poor people's lives easier in that sort of way could make a real difference to some people who otherwise would not be able to move into the workforce, for example. I, I want to follow up with that, this idea, because you bring it up in the book, this idea that, you know, for most things that the, just the unconditional transfer of money is better, but there are some services, as you said, to make life easier. Childcare is what you just brought up. Would that also align around healthcare and some of those other things that may be complicated, confusing, bring a lot of cognitive overload into people? And again, that the more, again, Tim and I are based in, in the United States, you are living in Sweden, very different health systems in those two countries. And is there a noted difference in how that impacts people if they may not have it, have to go through a whole bunch of hurdles in order to get that? Is that one aspect of this as well that you think might be beneficial? I don't know of any sort of systematic research on this, although there may well be um, such research. I can speak from personal experience, though. So yeah. having lived in the States, uh, I'm a naturalized citizen. I lived in the States for like two decades. And we had these two twins yeah. uh, who were born prematurely. And like seeing the bills, I, I don't even remember the number. I've successfully repressed like the numbers. <laughs> the kind of almost heart attack you get with two kids in a NICU, right? Oh. Top notch care in the DC area where the cost of living is high and whatever, that's stressful. We had excellent um, insurance, but even with excellent insurance, we were sometimes uh, billed incorrectly. And so there'd be a bill one day, like $14,000 for something. And then there'd oh be negotiations. God. I mean, to Americans, this is normal, right? The doctor in the NICU says, we need to do an extra x-ray. What are you going to do if you're a parent with no medical background? Are you going to argue with her? Of course not. You're going to say, sure, let's do an x-ray. But then the insurance company calls you three weeks later and they say, well, we're sitting in this strip mall in Arizona and we've determined that your child did not need that x-ray. And so now we're not going to pay for it. Here's a bill, um, you know, X thousand dollars and whatever. And the entire sort of medical billing industry in the way that Americans know it doesn't even exist in Sweden. You go to the doctor, if it's a child, it's free. Like medications yeah. are free. You don't need to get a credit card out. Um, you have to identify yourself when you when you enter, but there are no copays, nothing at all. Are there disadvantages associated with this? Of course, right? You might worry about some parents taking their kids in too often, you know, for trivial things. Um, so it's not like there's a free lunch here, but from the point of view of the parent or the patient, this obviously makes life a lot easier, a lot less stressful. And if you're not, like my wife and I, we have three PhDs between the two of us, right? We're extremely well equipped to deal with these sorts of negotiations, but obviously not every family does, right? And, you know, for some people, uh, I understand that this is really, really stressful, right? Bankruptcy is not that far away for a large share of the American population. And taking that prospect out of the equation 
can obviously make a big difference to to a person, especially if you already feel like you're balancing on the precipice, if you're already under great stress uh, and perceived scarcity and so on. Yeah, wow. We could we could just that's a hole that we would love to just spend a whole a whole episode on. Eric, <laughs> honestly, well, you're well gonna, actually, you're gonna I'm gonna jump in here. I'm gonna go a little bit different. So prior to the the episode, we were talking, and we ended up talking about means versus ends. And it was about vaccination and the the idea that there are some elements within that people, I won't go into the whole thing, but this idea that that sometimes there's a confusion around the ends that we're trying to achieve and the means to get to them. And in particular on vaccinations and some people potentially misinterpreting a concept about means when we're really trying to get to uh, the right ends and which is the better means to do that. I'm almost hearing the same thing as we're thinking about, as we think about people in their, uh, this whole UBI and various different aspects. If the end is to eliminate poverty, but there, we're looking at these different means. I, and, and I guess I don't have a really good question there, but is there something about the confusion between those two as it relates to why people may not be in favor of this, in your opinion? Yeah. So we, we were talking specifically about vaccination rates and how you increase vaccination uptake. And many behavioral scientists during the pandemic found themselves sort of squeezed between these two forces. There were the anti-vaxxers who were like incredibly aggressive off and on, on on social media, and then like pro-vaccination groups who were also pushing pretty, pretty hard. Um, many of the pro-vaccination groups we're in favor of mandates, right? Yeah. You mandate vaccines for college students, for young people, for school students, and for people who want to engage in all sorts of uh, practices, sports, and so on, people who want to visit your country. Uh, behavioral scientists will typically sort of agree with uh, the notion that vaccines are good, right? Uh, uh, there are very few anti-vaxxers among behavioral scientists. But behavioral scientists will often caution against overly heavy-handed approaches to this. So there's a ton of evidence that suggests that the major, the, the most important factor in vaccine uptake is trust. Mm. To what extent do you trust the doctor, the public health officials, the corporations, the medical companies, and whatever? What's lacking among people who don't get their kids vaccinated isn't typically acknowledged, but it's the major factor it tends to be trust. And so what the behavioral scientist will say then very often is that we need to work on things that enhance trust. Right? We have to inform people, obviously, but we have to explain to them why we think what we think, why we think it's a good idea for them to get vaccinated. Uh, what's at stake and so on, and build that sort of interpersonal trust. And that's something that you do on a small scale in local clinics with outreach activities. You involve people from the community going out into the community, especially in communities where where trust is, is low, right? You need to work with the community rather than against it. And so, just for example, there were rumors swirling around that uh, the vaccine had uh, effects for people's fertility, mm. right? And if you're a young woman, for example, you hear this rumor and then somebody comes in and says, hey, getting vaccinated is good for you. It's so good for you. We're going to force you to get vaccinated. That, you know, it's not going to feel good, right? Um, it, puts, it gives you a very hard choice either to comply with government orders or to you know, not. And this is not an enviable position for anyone to be in. That sort of activity risks undercutting trust, which is the critical factor in vaccine uptake. I'm simplifying, but you get the yeah. idea, right? And the trick here is that when, when behavioral scientists say, well, look, there's a better way to go about it, they sometimes get you know, associated with the anti-vaxxers, where, uh, <laughs> although that's completely wrong, right? Because the yeah. behavioral scientist in my scenario here agrees on the end, uh, it's good to get people vaccinated, you know, in accordance with instructions, but they disagree about the means. And that's a tension that I think we see a similar um, sort of dynamic in various areas where people don't quite recognize that we agree on the ends, where we disagree is like, how do we get there? Yeah. And I yeah. think one of the things that you bring up here too, and you bring it up in the book, is this idea that economists look at unintended consequences, right? The Not just the immediate, but what is the second and third order components of this. And I believe what we're just talking about kind of reflects some of that as well, 
oh, it might be great to mandate, but what are the unintended consequences that that has on trust that ultimately leads people to really, you know, go out and do what you're trying to get them to do? Right. No, exactly. I mean, this is a, it's such a big theme in the history of economics, right? This thought of unintended consequences and the emphasis on sort of thinking through all the different steps of what's going to happen if you affect a certain change. Economists will say solve for the equilibrium, but what they mean is just like think through the consequences of people adapting. That's often a, a good idea. People are autonomous entities. Like we can't push them around like chess pieces on a board. We have to reflect on their inherent uh, motion and their desires and so on. And some policies risk backfiring if we don't think of it uh, cleverly. Like mandates might work in the short term, and this is the fear, right? If you force your child to take out the trash or something, you say you have to take out the trash or I'm going to yell at you or something, maybe they will, but then they'll be resentful and angry. And the next time, maybe they'll figure out more inventive ways of like shirking their duty and whatever. <laughs> um, when it would have been much better, given that this is a repeated game, uh, to talk to them about the value of collaboration and the responsibility of living in a household and the, you know, the joys and pleasures of sharing burdens and, and, <laughs> and joys and so on, right? I needed to have this conversation with you oh. a, a, a few years ago with my kids, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go back. <laughs> How did that go? <laughs> this gets to this idea of a, a more localized discussion, and uh, and and I have to say, Kurt, your segue into vaccines was was perfect. It was better than mine. So so thank you for doing that because that's where I wanted to go. But like the vaccine question is really solved best in this local environment, you know, and really in an ideal world, sort of outside of the purview of social media, where we got all these crazy influences, these nut jobs out there providing, you know, all kinds of information that, that confuses us, you know, that that's really hard for us to deal with. And just to jump forward, again, climate change is one of the things that you spend a fair amount of time on. And this is not another one of those issues that that isn't easily solved with outside of the realm of the social media stuff, because there's so much, you know, there's so much conflict out there in the world. So let's get back to the heart of it. How can economics help us solve solve this climate change. <laughs> we should just start there. <laughs> well, no, but I just wanted to reflect on what you were saying. Right? So often these issues get tied up in like party politics or culture mm -hmm. wars or whatever. We saw that with face masks and with lockdowns and with vaccines and so on. And it, by the time something gets in gets involved in a culture war, rational discourse, you know, <laughs> may be hopeless, yeah. right? Or not totally yeah. hopeless, hard, I should say, not completely hopeless. But then there are there are ways out of it. And I think behavioral science really offers a, a, a way out. So if if we come at some problem with different perspectives, we should be able to look at the evidence and say, well, what does the evidence say? And maybe that gives us at least an opening, uh, the possibility of coordinating on some sort of solution. And I think climate change is a, a good example of that. So climate change is, again, obviously a very difficult problem. There's not going to be like one easy, quick fix. But economists have looked at this for a good long time. They've proposed a, a fix, a solution that just might work. The solution is solidly grounded in theory of a kind that everyone who studied economics will know. It's been empirically confirmed on a smaller scale in various countries uh, across the world. And um, the proposal is such that economists by and large agree on it. There was a specific version of this proposal that was announced a couple of years ago, and thousands of economists signed on to this proposal. Economists from left to right, Nobel winners, and and so on. And it's basically to tax the hell out of the carbon polluters, right? To put a tax on carbon dioxide that's high enough that it's going to discourage people from producing the quantities of carbon dioxide that, that cause so much harm. W it sounds kind of simple, right? How could this possibly work? Well, the point is that it would have multiple beneficial consequences. So it would penalize the people who are the worst offenders in, in this domain. They might choose to offend a little less. 
it's going to push consumers from high carbon dioxide products to low carbon dioxide products. It's going to push them to, to purchase goods with a, a smaller carbon footprint. That's going to generate innovation. So companies who could innovate to become better at producing good stuff without the carbon footprint are going to want to do so. The big polluters are going to want to figure out ways to produce the same product with a smaller carbon footprint and so on. And then the thought is that this tax should be dis distributed to the population. Everyone should get a, a share, a lump sum payment, as the economists say. And so if you're a low carbon polluter, if you live in a smaller apartment, you're mindful, you're driving, you don't have excessively large cars and whatever, you're going to end up in that, you're going to win, right? You're going to get more cash in hand than you have to pay in taxes. If you're a bad polluter, then that's not going to be true. But then it's putting the decision in your hands, right? And it's putting um, the cost, it's placing the cost at whoever is guilty of causing the, the problem. There's a lot to be said about this. There's a whole theory underlying it and whatever. But the point here is that there's a relatively simple, workable proposal that economists have lined up behind and that we haven't yet tried on a large enough scale. What's going on here, right? There's a reputation, there's a sort of sense that economists have too much power in government and so on. In this case, anyway, that's clearly not true because economists have not managed to get word out here. I have colleagues who work on climate change who've never heard of this proposal. And people who have heard of it might not understand the logic, right? They might not know the Econ 101 theory that sort of explains this. And and yet, it's not an unusual, it's not a weird proposal in a way. So we do similar things to alcohol and tobacco. We put specific taxes on alcohol, more so in some places than in others. Um, and uh, the, the, that sort of tax is supposed to accomplish much, much the same thing as the carbon tax is supposed to do. So this is like a strategy that's been tried. Um, and okay, it's not going to fix anything overnight, right? It might not be the only thing we need to do. We should not stop doing other things that are good for, for the climate. But there's a problem out there, right? Here's something that might work. Why don't we try it? Well, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question, but <laughs> I wish we gave it a shot. Well, you, you talked a, before a, a bit about, you know, once it gets into that political realm, rational discourse kind of goes away. And just by having the the word tax as part of that component, it becomes all of a sudden a political game and ship on some pieces. And that could be part of that. One of the interesting pieces in, in that in that section that we talked about climate change, though, you also talked about social norms. And you brought up Christine Bicchieri's work in, in uh, you know, the social norm work. And we've had her on the show a couple of times. Love her. She just, again, some of Wonderful. her work is, I think, really fascinating. So can you help um, and, and explain to our listeners how social norms come into change? And as we think about changing undesirable behaviors and uh, some of that work, and um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I'm just repeating what, what <laughs> Christina <laughs> says here, but the basic idea is that, you know, we might think of ourselves as like rational creatures, or we might think of ourselves as like creatures of habit or whatever, and we are that to some extent, but to a very great extent, we follow norms. We're creatures, we're social creatures, we're social beings, we follow norms. And norms are sort of rules that govern repeated interactions in a social context. And um, what that means is that if you want to understand why people do things, why they do really good things, like, you know, donate to charity, why they do really bad things, like sustain harmful practices, like female genital mutilation and so on, mm -hmm. you need to understand that behavior, not just in terms of individual cognitive states, like moral beliefs or religious ideas and so on. You need to understand these behaviors in the context of whatever norm is operating. And these norms, um, Christina says, and I think this is entirely true, are based on a sort of desire to follow norms. We have a desire to follow norms. We, we want to follow norms. Like that dream that people have, the nightmare of like showing up in class without pants or whatever, is a reflection of that, right? If wait, wait, wait. Else is we, more, people, pants. more people than me have that, <laughs> that dream? On Zoom, of course, that was never a problem, right? For most people, not a problem. I thought I was the only but, one. Unless you stand up and then, yeah. And, and we do that. And 
and um, you know, we want to do what other people do, uh, but the desire is conditional. So I only want to follow this norm if you guys are following the norm. So uh, if you think mm -hmm. about face masks on transit, right? Some places people wore them, some places they didn't. What's that about? Well, you can try to explain that in terms of individual moral beliefs or character or maybe genes. Um, but the most obvious explanation is probably going to be that in the one place there's a norm and in the other one there isn't. If everybody else in the room is wearing a face mask, I'll feel really, really bad being the one person, you know, who's not wearing one. But conversely, like if nobody else is wearing a mask, it's going to be weird to be sitting there with my little cloth mask or, or whatever. And so um, these norms are important for understanding behavior in all sorts of contexts, but they're also important for changing behavior. So if you're looking at some like really counterproductive or antisocial piece of behavior, the first suggestion is to look at, well, what are the norms that people are responsive to? What are the norms in place here? What are the norms that generate the kind of behavior that we dislike so much? And what can we do to change it? Because it turns out that people would sometimes be very happy with another norm. These are Nash equilibria in the technical sense, and there might be multiple equilibria. If everybody else is uh, you know, circumcising their daughters, you know, most people will want to do that because they fear that you know, an uncircumcised daughter might not be able to marry and so on. But if nobody else is, you know, why would you, right? And so this opens up for the possibility that the even relatively rapid social change might be possible in a way that respects people's pre-existing beliefs and values. You don't have to come in from the outside trying to change people's values. That would probably be a, a bad thing. Um, you can work with people's values, try to shift them from one norm to another, from one Nash equilibrium to another, and make everybody better off that way. So I bring this up in part as a sort of hopeful there's a hopeful message here. Yes, norms yeah. are sometimes extremely harmful. They can be persistent. They can last for centuries, right? You have these places where people are feuding, where honor requires that you kill somebody from the other family. And these feuds can go on for, for many, many generations. But change is, is possible. And social science gives us a way forward. Yeah. One thing that I think is really interesting because you bring up, and I was very happy to see this as part of your book, you you have a section on how to be happy, which again, if I'm just a normal everyday person and I'm thinking about economics and happiness aren't <laughs> necessarily two things that I would associate together. But I was really interested in, in some of the insights and I'm hoping that you could just help our listeners understand what makes us happy from an economic standpoint. <laughs> is it just more money? Because that's where I would think and, and correlate economics and, and happiness, but that's not necessarily what it is. So help us understand that a little bit. Let me say first off that people sometimes react with like disbelief when I talk yeah. about a science of happiness yeah. or whatever, because it sounds so weird. But there's literally like a hundred years of research on this and economists have been on it since the mid seventies, I guess almost 50 years now. So this is actually something that goes way back. And there's been a ton of research on this. There are very large data sets. Economists apply the very best statistical techniques to these data sets. And um, people are converging on certain kinds of answers to central questions. So when it comes to money and happiness, for example, right, it's often said that money can't buy happiness, but there's never been any doubt that poverty is bad for happiness. Like literally everyone that I'm aware of who studied this over the course of the last 50 years have agreed that poverty is a predictor of lower happiness. The question that people have discussed is like what happens on the upper end of the income scale? Like if you move from being poor to being middle class, there's no doubt that that's going to be good for your happiness. So in that sense, Money does buy happiness, at least, you know, for some people. The mm -hmm. the question that people have discussed concerns what happens on the on the upper end. And um I guess now people are converging on the notion that if some an increase in money is associated with an increase in happiness at every level of wealth. However, marginal happiness of wealth is sharply diminishing, right? So if you've studied economics at all, you know this idea of marginal utility and how it's diminishing. So this is exactly what you'd expect, right? The amount of happiness you get for a dollar goes down as you make more money. Like the last dollar gives you less and less pleasure. 
which is exactly what, what you'd expect. So what does that mean? Well, it's not totally obvious, but it doesn't mean that you should try to maximize wealth. Why not? Well, uh, increasing your income, increasing your wealth comes with some cost. You have to give something up, right? If you work, long, work longer hours, you're sacrificing leisure, sleep, time with your friends, time with your family or whatever. And those things might um, give you more pleasure than the last couple of dollars you would make if you go to work, you know, that weekend or whatever. And so people who think that we should maximize income based on this research are committing a straight up fallacy of ignoring opportunity cost, which by the way, is something you might learn the second week <laughs> of your economics class, right? And it also suggests, in, you know, this sort of, of phenomenon suggests that maybe some degree of redistribution would be good for happiness. So suppose we do that UBI thing that we were talking about, you tax people with means and you give everyone or the poor some unconditional you know, some lump sum, some some amount of money. Well, if the happiness that they get exceeds the loss in happiness among the, the richer parts of the population, well, then you can enhance total happiness in this way. Now, there are some complications here. Right? Taking money away from people might make them really angry, even if the <laughs> amount involved is small. small. So small you have to use a, yeah. uh, So you have to use a light touch. Um, but yeah, so that's that's one thing. And then there's some other sort of phenomena that people have studied. And so social comparisons is one of those areas. Um, there's a ton of evidence that we spend a lot of time comparing ourselves to others. I think of this like if you're driving on the highway, if you're making 55 and everybody else is making 75 miles an hour, you're going to feel like you're going really slowly, right? But if you're driving 55 and everybody else is driving 35, you're going to feel like you're traveling fast. And the point here is that when we assess how fast we're traveling physically and, and metaphorically, we, we don't often use like some absolute scale. We often don't have ac access to an absolute scale, like a, a measuring rod to see, you know, how tall you are or, or something. What we do is we look around and we see, you know, how much is he making or, you know, uh, how many papers did she publish last year or whatever. And what this means is that we, our judgment reflects not just our attainment in terms of things that we care about, but also the attainment of other people, where the better other people do, the worse off we are. But the key here is that the extent to which we compare ourselves with others is to some extent under our control, right? We can choose not to pay attention to uh, what other people make, right? Maybe somebody works longer hours, make more money. We can choose not to compare ourselves to that. We can say, I enjoy my, my leisure. I enjoy the camping trip with my family and so on more than I want to keep up with the Joneses. And so it's a, you know, an area where there's a rich uh, stream of research going back decades that leads to a relatively straightforward piece of advice. And, you know, I'll say I'll, I fall prey to this as well, right? Oh, I, What's a reasonable, <laughs> yeah, right. What's a reasonable like publication record? What's a reasonable, <laughs> you know, uh, teaching evaluation? Yeah. You, you know, I can't help comparing myself to, to others, but I, I try not to. Um, yeah. I try to set my own goals and live up to them. And I try to be satisfied when I hit that like yeah. absolute level. And sometimes at least I, I succeed. And it's interesting, our comparison groups change as we get more income. I, at one point, I'm comparing myself to these people, but now I need to, com I, I tend to compare myself to other people. One of the interesting things, and I think we've seen this too, with some of the, the recent research that comes out with from the Harvard Longitudinal Study and others, and I think you bring this up in the book, is the, the impact that social relationships have in happiness. Do you want to just touch on that really, really briefly as we kind of wrap, start to wrap up here? Yeah, so that's a, that's a big deal. Like having companionship, being part of a, a greater context, having friends is really important. Having happy friends seems to be best, right? <laughs> so happiness is contagious in a in a network of of friends. And you know, this is not exactly a huge revelation, right? This is what your grandmother would have told you if you asked. But nonetheless, this is something <laughs> yeah. that that science has, you know looked at and concluded that, yep, that's that's true. And I think there are some insights there for us. Like many of us spend too many 
hours in the office. Many of us spend a lot of time with people we haven't really chosen to spend time with. We don't reach out to our best friends, uh, maybe as often as we could, especially in a modern transient society where we don't live in the same neighborhood or in the same town, even country, even as our, our best friends yeah, and so on. We yeah. could, many of us could do more to nurture those sorts of relationships and maybe avoid the ones that are dead ends, to be honest. Wow. We are here with Eric Egner talking about his latest book, How Economics Can Save the World. And I have to switch over to ask you about music. I, we, 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 we haven't gotten to music yet, and I'm just dying <laughs> here because I know that you, you love music. So if you were stranded on a desert island for a year, and uh, let's say it's a pleasant stranding uh, with all good circumstances, and you could take two musical artist catalogs with you. What two artists would go along with you on that on that the, year long trip? The first one would be Tom Waits. I've listened to him <laughs> almost daily since some time in high school or early college, and wow. I find that no matter what stage of life I'm in, no matter what emotional state I'm in, there's something out of the Tom Waits catalog that that speaks to me. Um, because so he always has a sadder song than you can ever imagine <laughs> feeling in your own life. Is that why? <laughs> I guess that's it. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought of it in in those terms, but I I get it. I get it. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and who who would be your second? Uh, who would be your second artist? Yeah, you know the second one. I'm not sure, but uh, P. J. Harvey is somebody else I've listened to like very often for a very long time. I guess there's a sense in which she and Tom Waits fall in the same category, right? A little bit, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. I, I was, but yeah, I love I her almost, voice. I love her, her art. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I was almost hoping that if you're going to a female artist that you would have gone to Ricky Lee Jones, who, of course, was associated with Tom Waits for a while. I think they dated for a bit. And, and her stuff is at least occasionally more upbeat than Tom's, but yeah, I think <laughs> yeah, where, where, where do you pull the stuff out? I mean, <laughs> I, you know, the, 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 the connection of, oh my God, anyway, it, it, oh my gosh, Eric, it has been an absolute pleasure. We could go on and on oh, for hours. We have so uh, much more. We have so yeah, much more. We, yeah, we definitely want to get you back on the show at some point, but thank you so much. And thank you for the book. And thank you for all the research that you've done over the years. It has been uh wonderful following your career and the, the insights that you bring. And thank you. Well, thank you so much, guys. It's been an honor and a pleasure to talk to you. I, I loved every moment of it, and I hope to talk to you soon. Take care, everyone. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with Eric, have a free-flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our economically saving the world minds. How about that? Nice. Very nice. Nice. So this is the how to save the world with economics, not just how to save the world. Yeah, it's, it's not just discussion. saving. We're saving the world yeah. through... Actually, and this is interesting. Although the the title of of Eric's book is is how to save the world or save the world with how economics. Economics can save the world. How yeah. economics can save the world. He's really talking about behavioral science. You know, I have yeah, to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's there's it's a lot of it's 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 around economics, but it's behavioral science here. So, well, doesn't this kind of, it is, and I I love that actually. Um, but he very comfortably kind of blends all that, and this fits perfectly with that early metaphor that he introduced about the idea of curing the body with medicine. It's not like a pill cures the body. We've got a whole set of environmental things. We've got medicine overall is contributing to improving our bodily health and we you know there's lots of good statistics boy steven pinker's you know done a great job of arcing the the child mortality rate is down and and life expectancy is up overall except for last year and you know there's lots of good data that says there's a whole bunch of things that are contributing to improving our health medicine is a central and key part of it. And I think what Eric is saying is that let's focus on economics as one of the tools in the toolbox that can help us live a, live in a better world. And yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. And, and I want to go back to what we posed in the intro, right? Is that I want to I do want to have a conversation with listeners who can go out in social media and to, to say, are, are we 
is it too much to think that we can solve these problems? I mean, they have been around for a long, long time. Economics has been around since Adam Smith, and it hasn't, they haven't, economics hasn't solved these problems yet. So why should we think that we're going to be able to solve these problems now with with these economic behavioral science insights? And is, are we taking off more than we can chew on on this? Shouldn't we stick to, well, we can we can modify this little thing and we can do this little part over here as opposed to saying, we're going to eliminate poverty. We're going to change the climate. We're going to do all these other things. I mean, is that too much to ask? I think framing gets in the way. I think when we say eliminate poverty, I think the idea that goes along with that is that no one would ever be poor, period, that everyone would be having some kind of living wage. And I, I kind of go back to Mother Teresa's approach on this, where when she went to Calcutta, she's like, I'm not out to solve poverty. I'm just out to help the people who, who I can help you know, to make their lives better. Yeah. And so there was a very narrowly focused approach to this that I think we might be better off saying what, well, and, and Eric does this, how can it save the world or how can we improve the world? You know, well, I think we'll, later if we, if we get into discussions about poverty and, and the vaccines and things like this and means versus ends, I think we, we'll touch on this idea that, that maybe it's not about getting 100% of the entire population that is in poverty out of poverty but maybe we can improve our general well-being as a society and as a culture and as a as a world community. Well, we've solved wicked problems before. We talked about the medicine analogy already, right? We've we've done that. We've talked about, you know, some of the the other, you know, major things that I mean, some of these issues we've caused ourselves, but we've been able to do them the a hole in the ozone, right? Uh, that we yeah. we cause, but we're also we've also been able to put remedies in place, and it's closing up. And so there are, we know that these are big problems. We know that they're there, but as you said, we can economics, behavioral science, these insights, if they are used, if we have, as I like to say, if we have the balls to implement them, because some of them are going to cause some consternation. With some yeah. people and some political parties on both sides, depending mm -hmm. on how we do this, and it just takes a lot of of effort, willpower, and and kind of thing. Okay, so with that said, we want people to go out. <laughs> we want to have a conversation. We want your thoughts on this. But let's talk a little bit about what we discussed with Eric. What is what do you want to start with first? Wow, there's so many wonderful things. Maybe we should start talking about poverty because I think that that. That hey, overarches a lot of things. Right? You know, I, I think we uh, Eric was on target because he agreed with what I already thought. So oh, yeah. there you yes, go. Yes, right. He, you got your confirmation bias. Yes, for the day, it worked right? out really well. I got my confirmation bias, you know, just that when dopamine re went way high in my brain as soon as I read he likes unconditional transfers, that this yeah. idea of just giving people money mm -hmm. can actually go a long way in improving this and the the idea the worry that some people have of just giving people money well you're going to give these you know these poor people have poor judgments and bad character and low values well no that's not what the research <laughs> says it's yeah. it's actually contradictory to that so it is really a terrible thing when i think about how um political parties that uh, demonize poor people, th that they really miss the opportunity to say, well, how is it that people who start out as poor are sometimes not poor? You know, that throughout their lives, they they get out of poverty. And, you know, are, are they really that different from, a, not from a striving perspective, but from a, from sort of a psychological and emotional perspective? They're the same as everybody else. Now, they may have different luck and they might have different desires and different striving sort of DNA in them. Uh, I get th that they are different in many ways, but when it comes to a just general psychology, they suffer from all the same things that everybody else does. But you talk about the striving piece, and this is a thing that I think at least I've heard a lot of the arguments against universal basic income or just giving cash grants to people is that by doing so, you 
take away people's motivation to work hard, oh, to right. do things. And that is, and, and again, I, I get why people think that, right? It's this idea, and it goes to the, the fundamental attribution error. Because if you ask them, well, if I That's gave right. you $1,000 a month, would that mean that you would quit your job and just play video games all day? And they go, well, hell no, that wouldn't be me. But those people over there, those I know exactly people. that's what they will be doing. They would do that. And yep. it is the the research just goes to show that, you know, when you do that, people are spending that money on basics and goods. And it actually allows them to strive more. They can start a new business because they don't have to worry about, you know, keeping uh, the roof over their head or food on their plates. And so right. now they can take That's more right. risks and they can be more productive and they actually do more and are more motivated because, again, we talked about scarcity and that scarcity mentality takes AIQ off, you know, a whole bunch of different things that scarcity is just horrible at from. And if you can reduce that that feeling of scarcity that I always am looking out to where my next meal is coming from, how I'm going to pay that medical bill, the fear of losing my car, all of those things, it frees up so much more for people to be able to do and contribute to society. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The opposite of the trickle down economics model that, <laughs> that just says, if we just don't tax the rich enough, they'll spend so much money that everybody benefits, which is horse hockey. That has <laughs> never never come to to pass horse horse hockey yeah i don't know it's a, it's a way of it's it's That's a, a st it's louis idea. thing isn't it is that a it a, might be yeah okay yeah yeah okay but but what about the the trickle down effect that comes from reducing stress uh, you know, among poor people, and maybe the family stays together. Maybe they make better decisions about their work and their job, and they have the ability to keep their job longer because they don't have to worry about daycare, you know, for their kids. And there's there's a whole bunch of domino effect uh, things that that follow on from that. I have to just jump over to this idea of when it comes to happiness. Yeah, you know that. Jeremy Bentham talked about this this idea that that if the king is a hundred times richer than the poorest person, that king is not a hundred a thousand times happier. Than, uh, yeah, a thousand times richer, a thousand times happier. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I totally screwed that up, but I love Bentham and and I love this concept because it's a really great way of thinking. Okay, so if the king isn't a thousand times happier, but the king is a thousand times richer, then maybe there's a way of of improving happiness overall by the king not being quite a thousand times richer what if the king were only 900 times richer and he gave a hundred of that riches you know to the poor and again this goes back to what what eric was talking about in regards to the marginal utility of additional money and and what that does not marginal utility the marginal happiness that you gain from additional dollar and right. and when you study happiness and you study, you know, money in its relationship to this, what you realize is that, yeah, that additional dollar influx, if I am making, you know, $10,000 is huge. If I'm making $50,000, it's a little bit less. If I'm making $200,000, that additional dollar is nothing. If I'm making right. millions and millions of dollars, it's less than nothing. Right, it's it is barely a it drop is, in the it, bucket. It's, it's not. It's not noticeable. It's not noticeable at all. And losing and taking some of again, this goes back to taxing. You know, rich or excessive profits and variety of different pieces. And people will talk about, well, that will reduce overall, you know, motivation to do this. And I, I, I always tell people, I'm going, if I am in business and I am looking at. You know, if I'm going to make an investment, right, that's one of the things they talk about. And if I base my decision on the tax rate, I am a freaking poor business person. I am yeah. looking to say, is this going to add revenue over and above the expenses that I have? And if I do that and I'm making a profit and that profit needs to be at a certain level that I feel safe and comfortable with it, then that profit, regardless of what it's taxed at, is going to be profit for me. And yes. I should yeah. do that again if I am a, a rational business person and looking at this. 
And that idea then that to use that additional revenue to bring or that additional tax to then support the lowest level of our society and make sure that they have a, a living wage or some element of this that is is going to help provide them with money that is going to do it. The marginal utility of that additional dollar for their happiness is way more than the dollar way that's going to be for me. Anyway. And just think about a world, imagine a world where everybody is less stressed. I, I don't mean to, that, again, this might be getting back to your comment in the introduction about being Pollyanna-ish, right? Yeah. Okay, there might be something a bit Pollyanna-ish to think that what if there were just a little less stress in the world? Then do we actually have as much road rage? Do we have as many people acting badly, violently in public situations? Maybe some of that goes down because there's just a little bit less stress in the world. Yeah. It could happen. Yeah. It could happen. It could and happen. Thank goodness for Eric pointing out that economics could help us get there. Well, and, and, and I, I do want to get into, we didn't get to talk about a, a bunch of stuff in, in the book that I thought were really great. One of the things that he talked about in the book in regards to happiness, because it's kind of this, you know, one of the newer things that I'm just really excited and reading a ton about is that he says in the book, one consistent result is that most people are pretty happy. And he talks yeah. about a uh, euphoria meter that was done by oh. God, who was it? I can't remember who it was back in the 1950s or something like that, yeah. where it's euphoria units, right? This this euf euphoria um, units that that are this is measured in, and in that um, measurement, 75 percent of people are above zero euphoria units, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. And then the Cantrell level ladder, which is an interesting way. It's the way that when you think about the World Happiness Index, they they measure this through doing surveys around the Cantrell level, which is basically on a ladder. Uh, where do you rate yourself at the top rung or at the middle rung or at the bottom rung on your happiness level? And when they look at that, when they, they measure countries, 101 out of 149 countries are above the midpoint on the Cantrell lever. lever. So again, more yeah. countries than uh, almost double the number of countries are above the midpoint of saying, you know, I'm I'm, I'm generally more happy than than not. That's not saying that there isn't, you know, sadness and, Room to and, yeah. and you know, depression in the world and anxiety as we've talked about with others is increasing and a whole bunch of other things, but in general we are happy and I think that's a really positive thing that we don't notice and we need to build on that that this idea we we hear about the sadness and the anxiety and the depression that is increasing what we don't hear is that the base rate of happiness is actually pretty high across the board so uh, one of the challenges that go with that is this comparative idea this, yeah. uh, aside from the hedonic treadmill of how we adapt to our level of happiness then as soon as we get comfortable with where we are then we start looking around and saying well Am I as happy as that person? Am I as wealthy as that person? Do I have the things that that person has? And and Eric really summed it up beautifully talking about being on the road yeah. with if I'm if I'm going 55 miles an hour and everyone else is going 35, I'm zooming past them. I'm flying and that probably feels pretty good. But if I'm going 55 miles an hour and everybody else is going 75 and they're zooming past me, I don't feel as good even though I'm going the same rate in both of those situations. So there is this comparative side that I don't know how we get out of that. Yeah. Well, I, there, there has been research again that people have asked, and I'm going to misquote this, but it, the basic concept of this is, would you like a job that pays $125,000, but all of your peers are making 150, or right. would you like a job that pays you $100,000 and all of your peers are making $80,000? And people there's a the pretty large subset of people who take the hundred thousand dollar job, it, and if you think when of, their peers are making less, because yeah. their peers are making less, and those around them are making less, and so a hundred thousand versus one hundred twenty five, I am giving up twenty five thousand dollars just to be feeling this feeling that I am above and better, and and and, and we we laugh at that. Right. We go, well, that's just silly. That's irrational. That's all of these things. But it's not when we think about what it means for our happiness, because as we yeah. said, happiness is comparative. And so 
my overall happiness might be a lot higher because I take that job at a lower pay than a higher pay. So, all right. And this is the problem that I don't know how to get around. Yeah. This is one of the things that if we raise everybody's level of happiness, there's still going to be a comparative aspect to it. Yeah. So there you go. All right. right. So, um, Climate change, we just carbon tax and we're done. So let's, we, we don't need to talk about that. Just let's do a carbon okay. tax. Let's get that done. We'll make it happen. All right. But okay. means versus ends. Let's talk a little bit about oh, that before yeah. we wrap up. Because I think okay. it is very interesting. And I thought Eric brought up a really great concept here is this idea that we confuse the means with the end. So if the outcome that we want and is- this, this was in the vaccination discussion. This is right? in the vaccination discussion, you know, but if the outcome that we want is people to be vaccinated, you know, but we get stuck up on some ideas about the means to do it, then we're, we're, we're too short-sighted and we, we get confused, Right. The idea because that they're m- mandating vaccinations again is that, yeah, that might work in the short term, but in the long term, what what are the consequences of that? Yeah, it takes some of the nuance out of the discussion, right? That if, if for instance, we've got someone who is in a particular situation that a vaccine wouldn't work for them because of their particular biology, physiology, you know, set up their DNA, whatever, that uh, that a vaccine could actually be dangerous for them. Well, if we have the mandate, we say, no, 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 doesn't matter. You, the mandate is you have to get vaccinated. Then we run into a problem of the nuance of what about the individual? What about the this person having a conversation with their physician and saying, in my situation, I'm not sure how this would work. Let's have a a thoughtful discussion about how this would work. And still, we, we're still shooting for the, the end, which is maximize the health of the population. Vaccines help the maximize the health of the population. So let's shoot for that. But let's not miss out on the nuance that goes into what might happen to get there. You know, how we get there, the means to get there might be the mandate tends to be a blunt instrument. I right. Suppose. And, and we can think about this in, in other ways as well. This idea that if you start demanding, you might get reaction, uh, a reaction, a yeah. reactance. Sorry, I'm trying to remember the right words. And I, you know, I don't do that well, but you might get reactions. You might get this guttural reaction to say, no, you're trying to tell me what to do. Therefore, I'm going to ge- go deeper on the, on the other end. And so again, right. you have unintended, in. Yeah. unintended consequences of that. You can think about this too in other areas beyond vaccination. And when people have the these purity tests about, you know, again, we're talking social norms and, and teams. And so my side says that we have to do X and your side has, we have to do Y. You're both trying to get to the same outcome. You're just looking at the means and then you get ostracized if you're not believing in X on this side and you're not believing in Y on this side right. when there's probably some, this is political, right? It's the the element of, of moderation and, you know, backing down and saying, we'll accommodate you if you accommodate us. And it typically probably is driving to a better result. Maybe not always, but we don't do that. We look at the means and say, this is our our litmus test. This is our line in the sand when right. really we need to be looking at the outcomes. We need to be looking at what are we trying to, again, political parties. We're trying to have a successful country where people are happy, where they are proud to be members of the society, that they give back, that we have less crime, you know, we have healthy individuals and you know, if if we all said that, that's probably the outcome that we want. Yeah, it, it could be universally agreed upon. Universally right? agreed upon as an as an end. Yeah. yeah, as long, but but we we tend to then villainize the other side because they think the way that we get there is through one means, and we think we're going to get through it in an in a different means, and it's just sad. So. 
Yeah, it re- it actually reminds me of a conversation I had with a a very prominent behavioral scientist recently who is very pro vaccine. He's just period. There's nothing that he's not he is totally pro vaccine. I think he's even immunocompromised himself, right? So he also introduced this idea that maybe this, a mandate could be a, a blunt instrument that there might be better ways, maybe community advocacy and, you know, and conversations with physicians and family, like there might be better ways of getting trust into the environment to improve the general consensus around, around taking vaccines. And somehow that got twisted mm. that some people started to claim that he was an anti-vaxxer. He's not towing the line. It's like, this is right. not, you You are saying yeah. that mandates are bad, so you must be an anti-vaxxer, which is just, yeah. yeah. It, it's, again, we we put too much emphasis on that and not enough on looking for those commonalities that we all have in common. So, yeah. all right, yeah. we could go on and on. I, I do want to say that, get the book because there's a whole section on markets that we didn't get to talk about ones that work and ones that don't talk about kidneys and other things. But, you know, besides that, go so buy the book, buy the book. It's really great. And I think market. Yeah. I think that that wraps this episode of behavior grooves up and we hope that you enjoyed our talk with Eric and that it makes you think, think just a little bit more differently. And maybe that thought could actually translate into new behavior. Maybe maybe you could actually follow the arc through to do something in your environment or do something in your habits, your routines, to actually change your behavior. Like? Like joining in our conversation on Twitter. Yes. How about that? How about that? Don't be shy. Just tell us what you think. And we want to know if you think that economics has some solutions for some of the more wicked problems out there. And more importantly what that means for us. What do we, as a community of people who are interested in this, need to do in order to help solve those big, wicked issues? So we hope that this little bit of behavioral science insight from our conversation with Eric gets you thinking that you might go out and use it this week to actually go out and find your groove and maybe even save the world! (laughs) Oh, I wish we could. Here we go.